Thanks, Micah. And look, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and I've I really enjoyed the the research and everything that I've done for this. So the topic that I'm speaking on today is life extension, and I'm trying to be intensely practical to uh, talk about what we can do, how we can prepare, and what's likely to happen, and also to talk about some evaluation skills that can help you personalise um, things just to you. So the objective is to ask some of these questions. Um, should we treat ageing? What's the literature telling us how to do that? What's the emerging science? How we can evaluate information and apply it to yourself and your family? Uh, in preparation for this, I covered, uh, I read these nine books. I didn't read them all in the last month, but some of them were some time ago. And they uh, go back to, I guess, 2004 with, on top here we've got uh, Ray Kurzweil um, through to um, Sergey Young's book, which was published on the 21st of August, 2021. So uh, it was fortuitous that I just managed to read that. Um, and and it's and I, I really recommend it. It's excellent. Um, the other one, the, this Andrew Steele book is quite new too. And that's, uh, that's also an excellent one out of these. I, I thought I'd probably rate those two um, the best. I also really like um, Ray Kurzweil and Terry Grossman's uh, transcend uh, that's that is 2007 I think no 2009 yeah and uh, Elizabeth Blackburn the telomere effect brings a, a completely different um, view to some of the other ones but Elizabeth Blackburn is the uh, Australian Nobel laureate who discovered um, telomeres okay so <clears throat> as you can tell I'm Australian and here's two more Australians does anybody know who these two people are does anyone know who's the guy on the left? Okay, the guy on the left is our Prime Minister. Uh, as you can see, his name is Scott Morrison. Um, I, I quite like the guy. Um, he runs a reasonable sort of centre-right government. Um, he, you can see he's looking a bit old, he's looking a bit grey, uh, a bit bald, not in great shape, although he seems pretty energetic. But um, the fact is he's... Uh, three and a half years younger than me and I don't have much grey hair uh, yet. Uh, on, on the right is a guy called David Sinclair. Has anyone heard of David Sinclair? He's, uh, he, he's another Australian guy and he's, um, he's a Harvard professor. He's the professor of genetics and co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Centre for Biology and Aging Research at the Harvard Medical School. So what would you pick as the age difference between these two people? Um, so I've just told you roughly how old uh, our Prime Minister is. He's about 52. Uh, how old do you think David Sinclair looks? 35. Yeah, he's 13 months younger than the Prime Minister. So, so <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk and I'll, I'll be bringing forward some of his work. Uh, I would like to say you look much better than the Prime Minister. Thank you, Omar. I'll, I'll, I appreciate that. He's, <laughs> but I haven't had such a stressful job as he's had. He's, uh, yeah, he's in a, in, a, in a terribly cutthroat and stressful environment. All right. Um, so we, we get uh, people ask, should we treat ageing? Um, and we, we kind of want to put questions like this in a box and we say, is it a disease? Is it a condition? Um, am I going to do this? And we, we put all these incredible implications over the top of things and, and our minds kind of run away. Um, so I, I sort of like to ask rather than shall we call ageing a disease, I'd, I'd rather just say, can we just what this one says on this side, medical research, treating aging can we just treat it don't worry about whether it's a disease or a condition or can we treat it in the same way that uh, you know I, I treat my fitness for instance and the, a, a common thing you'll hear is that um, disease is defined as disordered or abnormal function aging is universal everyone catches it that which is universal cannot be abnormal therefore aging is not a disease it's a natural process we hear that from a lot of people and some for some reason humans we want to put causes of action in a box so we can define it as a good cause or a bad cause and join our team who are all campaigning for the same thing. 
I, I want to try and push aside this sort of, I guess, worldview and concept building on top of things and just come back to um, what's a good thing to do and what's your choice and, and what are the implications. So a lot of this goes back to Aubrey de Grey, who spoke at our conference in 2019, and he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for, for a lot of vision and foresight. And he came up with these seven deadly things and their fixes. This is from his book, but actually that's 2005. He actually had, had these ideas um, several years earlier than that. Um, in 2013, there was a seminal paper written called Nine Hallmarks of Aging. And it's genomic instability, telomere shortening, epigenetic alterations, uh, loss of proteostasis, um, deregulated nutrient sensing, sensing. Now, a lot of these things are probably hard to understand. You don't know what they are unless you really take an interest and read. They roughly map probably 60 to 70% over Aubrey's list, but they're more detailed and it kind of represents the next generation moving on from, from where what Aubrey did sort of 15 plus years ago. Uh, and you can Google all these terms. I, I'm going to go through quite a lot of stuff relatively quickly. Um, and it's more about uh, giving you um, ideas of where to jump off and, and how, to, how to jump or jump in and, and how to jump in. So, and there's commonly a 10th one called protein glycation. And you can read all these things. What I will talk a little bit about is cellular senescence, because I think that's important and stem cells. So those, those two I'll talk a little bit more about because they're a bit more accessible than some of the others. Uh, and so the question is why address aging? Well, your other alternative is what we call the whack-a-mole approach. Um, these are very predictable things that happen as we age. So if you could come up with a, an approach to tackle all of these in one go, then uh, maybe give people five, 10, 15 years uh, better, which is a, a reasonable goal at the moment with where we are. It seems to be um, only a logical thing to try to, un to address the underlying process. So these authors, starting with de Grey, Kurzweil, Sinclair, Andrew Steele, um, Sergey Young with his new book and um, Neil Barzilai, they've all, um, had, they've all, as individuals, had this vision and, and agreed with it. Um, we've also seen the, uh, the billionaires come along. So Google have started Calico. There's the Chan Zuckerberg Science Program who plan to cure all disease and Bezos Teal, the Unity Biotechnology. So they're, they're getting on board with this approach as well. Um, and the FDA, there's just signs that the FDA, the American Food and Drug Administration, there's just some signs that they're gonna be receptive to some of this stuff also. Uh, and I will talk more about uh, the, where the FDA is going and where the consumer market is going. And there's a, there's a real tension there and I'll, I'll come to that. There's also a bunch of uh, universities, including um, David Sinclair, looking at this, right. And why? Because it fundamentally makes financial sense. Uh, all, all nations have health budget problems. It's, uh, the health budget is always increasing and anything we can do to uh, you know, make, the, make the place uh, better from that budget perspective just makes good sense on every front. So I think there's a, there's a compelling case here that we should treat aging, address aging, address these underlying factors. And a lot of people will start to um, extrapolate from that and say, oh, you want to live forever, you want to do this, you want to do that. Okay, that, that's in the future. We're just going to take you know, one step at a time. The medical medicine has just been fantastic. Uh, the things that it's done over the years. Um, but there are, there are some possible criticisms of medicine. Um, there's, there's the concept of the managed decline. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll just sort of watch you go downhill. Um, there's the, the waiting for symptoms instead of... Uh, proactively trying to measure and tweak things that, that are going on in your body ahead of time um, and not treating the whole person. And, uh, you know, it's a classic, you know, sure, you, we might treat your cancer, but there's broken relationships and feeling of nihilism. Sometimes we, we see, we treat what we can see and, and what we don't see. Uh, uh, one day I was walking um, 
in a, in a public place, in a very prominent public place in, in Sydney. I had a broken arm and I had a plaster all over my face because I'd just been in a bike accident uh, the weekend before. And uh, some young guy was, and with his girlfriend came up and said, oh, let me pray for you. And I said, well, everyone's prayed for me at church already. But there's a lot of people walking around with a lot of problems that you can't see who aren't getting that kind offer. And it was just in a public place and it was a, it was a completely new experience for me to, to, uh, to be a visibly injured person instead of an invisibly injured person, which, uh, uh, which I guess we all are at various times. Um, and so medicine, rather than just fixing things up, there's a lot of proactive things that we can do right now to get in front of the curve. And I'll be talking about the emerging treatments and technology coming soon. All right, so I'm going to go right to the nub of the matter here and and uh, give you um, give you all the answers first, and then talk through them. So having read um, those nine books and a whole bunch of papers and and uh, stuff that I found on the internet, I form my own view of what you want to do today in terms of reward for effort. Starting right now, what can I do? Uh, the first thing is medical screening, uh, getting your mindset and stress, being able to immediately resume a contemplative posture, which is defined as a long, loving look at the real. Thank you, Terry. Uh, that's one. Um, <clears throat> Jane's understanding your family risks, or and you may need to get genetic counselling. You may not, and you might want to decide whether that's worth doing. Exercise, diet supplements and future technology. So those are, in terms of effectiveness, what do you want to do today? This is the stuff that you can, you can start with. And particularly um, Transcend, this is uh, Ray Kurzweil's and Terry Grossman's book. Um, and the uh, Transcend is in fact uh, an acronym, Talk to Your Doctor Relaxation. So uh, let's, sort of roughly the, the program that, that I'm recommending, um, but I'm just sort of making it short and punchy and you can jump off and go into all sorts of things. The other uh, one that I found really interesting is um, Elizabeth Blackburn, who's the Nobel laureate who discovered telomeres. Um, in her book, she doesn't mention supplements. She doesn't mention using telomerase to artificially um, extend your, tel your telomeres. She talks about First thing is mind your telomeres, evaluate sources of persistent, intense stress, maintain your telomeres, be active, connect your telomeres, make room for, you know, she'd, she'd get on really well um, with our previous speaker and create telomere health in your community and, and in the world. So I was just fascinated that uh, someone at the forefront of technology was putting all the foundations um, back on what we already know. Okay, so uh, first jumping in then to medical screening. Um, so you should, this is what you should be able to, to do, at least annual check. So you just go to your doctor and say, look, give me a check everything. What can you check? Um, blood chemistry, cholesterol, tumor markers. So the doctor that I go to um, for this every year, he checks four different tumor markers. And he told me last time that uh, roughly every two months, he has to have a hard conversation with someone and say, hey, you've got a tumor. Someone says, tumor, I feel fine. And he said, well, and then they um, do some investigation and inject some stuff to find this tumor and, and then they extract them when they're the size of a pinhead. Right? So that's saving people from, and, and that's a very cheap procedure compared to um, letting it get cancerous. Um, another thing that happened to me, so this is a funny story. Um, in 2017, I was uh, training on my bike really hard and there's this, this hill that we all go up um, not far from my house. Uh, and it, it's a 2.2 it's a kilometre hill at 9%. So it's a fairly steep hill. I get up there. I was getting up there at that stage about 12 minutes. The, the record's about seven and uh, I'm probably in the middle of the field. Uh, and I, I went to the doctors because, and I said to the doctor, I said, look, something's going wrong. I should be going 20 seconds faster up this hill I feel like there's something wrong with oxygen transport. And the doctor laughed at me and said my brakes were dragging and I had to sort of insist, but she, she sent me for blood tests anyway. And it, it turned out that I actually had an iron deficiency. Uh, now, I wouldn't have known that 
I, I didn't even feel bad walking around the place. It was only when I was doing this really um, careful measurement of my time going up this hill that I just said, something's going wrong. Uh, and my, my intuition was, uh, was proven by the science. And the doctor was actually impressed <laughs> you know, that it turned out to be correct. Um, so that's why, you know, if you don't monitor yourself and, and monitor your, your blood, these sorts of things, they're going to happen. Another important thing is skin checks. So I go twice a year and I'm getting about one thing cut off a year at the moment, but I grew up in the bright sunshine here in, in Queensland. Uh, and also importantly, keep your own records. Uh, when I had that iron deficiency, um, my hemoglobin was down. I had 10 years of hemoglobin tests. So I pulled them out. I drew a little graph. It was seven standard deviations, this reading below. So I went to the doctor and I said, look, here's this reading. It's seven standard deviations below. So that something, something's going on. Uh, and the other, the other thing to remember is that we are all individuals. So um, different things can go on for different people. Um, the doctor said I should be eating more red meat. And I said, well, I've just been trying to cut it out uh, because plant protein is better. And the doctor said, well, you know, don't believe everything you read on the internet. If you've got an iron deficiency, uh, supplements aren't going to do it. Get, get red meat into here. Um, and so I did a bit more research and um, instead of beef, I decided I'd try and switch to kangaroo. So uh, kangaroo is the, just about the healthiest red meat on the planet. Uh, it's 2% fat, it's cheap as chips, and uh, there's no extra animal cruelty involved because they're all just being shot as pests anyway. There's like about 50 million of them in the country. Uh, so on animal cruelty, greenhouse gas, health, cost, it's a great meat. I just recommend it. Um, it'll keep you hopping. Um, yeah, but where well, do you get kangaroo if you're right. in Australia? <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's some very entrepreneurial people in the room. I mean, there's people who've started businesses like Lincoln and, and Mark, who's not here. So, you know, there's, uh, there's piles of it here that have, uh, that's just being shot and burned and buried. Um, someone could turn that into a, a fabulous health food. We could replace a significant chunk of uh, the world's beef with kangaroo. That would help greenhouse gas and all sorts. Of things. Anyway, I'll leave hey, okay, that, John, I'll leave that John, here as an idea. Jonathan, Americans can't eat something that cute, can't they? <laughs> Aren't cows cute? <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> Second thing, stress. Now, our, our um, previous speaker, Terry, he, he did really, really well. That whole Sabbath pause thing is the antidote to anxiety, to be able to recover that contemplative posture, to, to pause when the divine says, stop, trust, and rest. Uh, I, I can probably skip the rest of what I have to say on this, but I, I'll at least, uh, uh, I, I will keep going. Um, so, uh, researchers find evidence that stress does turn your hair grey and it can be reversed. You just need a holiday. <clears throat> so I was a little bit sceptical about reading this. Um, uh, there was one individual who went on vacation and five hairs on that person's head reverted back to dark during the vacation, synchronised in time. Um, so what they did was they got, this, they got these people and they took their like 100,000 or so hairs and, and, and cut them all off their heads. And then they examined them all on electron microscopes and found that five of them had changed back from being gray to dark. A little bit, you know, a little bit skeptical of that. I mean, how did they know which end of the hair it was for a start? It would have been a terribly uh, difficult logistics exercise, but uh, despite that, I think it's, it's actually telling the truth. And, and we, you know, as, as Terry was saying, um, we've got a special um, distinctive improvement here to understand what is that Sabbath rest for the people of God. Uh, everyone knows this. We've all been uh, weary, burdened and heavy laden at times. Take my yoke and learn from me. Um, my yoke is easy and my, my burden is light. Well, what can we learn from that? I think basically don't, don't carry burdens that God doesn't want you to carry. There's things that God wants you to be burdened about and there's things that God doesn't want you to be burdened about. And I can tell you a big thing he doesn't want you to be burdened about is the, the noise that you asked about before, Omar, when you asked uh, the noise in the online space and listening to the anger. 
there's a burden that a lot of us just don't need to carry. Drop it, forget it. Uh, what can we learn from this? And the other, um, the other fundamental flaw in in US and more and Western thinking generally is this whole idea of the pursuit of happiness. Um, every individual has a happiness set point that is um, by predisposition and and genetic and. It, it does go up and down with things. If you have a, a tragedy, if you have something really good happen, if you um, get into a career that you like, the happiness set point uh, does go up and down, but, but pursuing it, pursuing happiness uh, in itself is, is a dead end. Um, I'd like to suggest we should be pursuing uh, vocational fulfillment and relationship fulfillment rather than quote, happiness unquote. Uh, and so there's, have anyone heard the word you stress before? It means, um, means good stress. You know, it's stress that, that's uh, exciting, that's encouraging. It's uh, getting your, your positive adrenaline going. You feel like you're making a difference. Um, what did Terry say? He said, um, non-anxious urgency. And then there's distress when bad things happening. And then you've got to learn to de-stress. So you've got to try and work out what's the right level of stress in your life. And when stressful things come, particularly at work, try and see it as a challenge, as a game, as a vocation. Um, tell yourself, look, if this, goes, if this job goes wrong, I'll get something else. Yeah, how can, how can I have the right amount of stress in my life? And often that means not spending money on dumb stuff, you know, because that leaves you with debt, debt stressful. And when you do get distressed, do manage it, do get help, do take control. Uh, do make a plan for saying, look, this distressing thing's happened. I need to manage this and um, engage people like Terry or, or whoever to, to get under control. So the first action here is to diagnose what's causing stress in your life, which is probably time wasting, non-useful debts is the first two things to think about and then contemplate. Is this a good time? Each time you're spending money or time, is that a good investment? Uh, brain care, so particularly as we're aging, um, Alzheimer's is a problem and stress is your brain's enemy. Uh, but what, what you can do is you can always learn, right? I started learning Spanish when I was 47 years old. Um, I had a, a job in South America for a while and uh, within a few months I was communicating with people. Within a year I passed um, university level. You find enjoyment, that's a really good thing to do. And when you learn, you're building new neurons and that's uh, neuroprotective. Um, pick up a new skill um, and your brain is plastic, the brain plasticity and there's, there's a, a fabulous book written on that also, um, which I can find if anyone's interested. Um, uh, we were taught in the past that brains didn't change and heal and repair themselves, but they do, they continually do so. You can grow neurons, uh, an important, factor in stress also is uh, connection to the divine and I cannot add anything to what our previous speaker said on that topic and cultivate that flow state if you look up um, Mihaly um, I've never attempted to pronounce that and he's usually just Mihaly C if you start typing Mihaly CS it will come up in your browser I'm sure uh, and everyone has everyone heard the expression flow state when you when you're in a a state where you're not thinking about the time, you're just going and, and just functioning really well. And so this becomes a virtuous circle. You can improve your brain to reduce your stress and you can reduce stress to improve your brain. So that's, that, that's gonna either be a positive circle or a negative circle. So let's, yeah. Uh, and there's a common misconception. I mean, certainly when I was growing up, there was this, uh, urban myth that you never um, got any new brain cells. And it's true, neurons don't divide, but there are um, neuron stem cells and progenitor cells that, that will come into your brain and that will grow. And there was this long, there was this dogma that adult brains couldn't generate new brain cells. You can, if you um, in, attentively and purposefully decide to do so. And for those of us who've uh, had a longer engagement with the faith, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of scriptural commands here uh, that is familiar to, to all of us. Um, if you get yourself in this, 
kind of mindset and this kind of spirituality, it absolutely has a measurable effect. And there's a lot of studies on this, on stress reduction and on your health span. Uh, there's a lot of measurable science that uh, people that practice this stuff. Uh, you know, it's five plus years on your life before you start anything else. All right, so that I'm talking about seven things. I talked about stress. Next one is genes. Um, there's a saying that if you make it to 75 years old, then 75% of that is lifestyle. And then if you make it to 100%, then 70, 100 years old, then 75% of that was, was due to genes. So it's worth knowing your, your family risks. And I know what my family risks are. I've, uh, I've um, watched the, the older folks on, on, uh, on both sides. Uh, there's a lot of this sort of my DNA consumer testing going around. Um, I haven't done that. Um, I haven't had the need. Um, but if you, if you know that you've got some serious family risks, it, it might be appropriate for you. But do just talk to your doctor and get some insurance advice. It can impact um, your insurance premiums and stuff. Remember, genes are not destiny. Um, it may not tell you useful. It may not influence your behaviour or it might be important. But it's certainly worth... Um, uh, knowing your family risks in the first and then talk to your doctor if you, if you know you've got family risks and say, you know, is it worth going for this sort of consumer testing? Or if you just want to try it and be an early adopter, then go for it. It might be useful. You might, um, in the future, um, you'll be able to know what genes you have and then know what interventions will change the expression of those genes. And there'll also be uh, common gene therapies. Um, and what will happen is your doctor will, uh, there might be five drugs to treat something and the doctor might plug your, your genome into, into the AI and say, right, of these five drugs, I'm giving you number four. Well, that's, that's all coming. Okay, next one, exercise. Possibly your most potent, potent weapon. Um, if you haven't been doing any, possibly the best thing you can do, but do talk to your doctor and get checked out um, before you do anything. Um, or before you make a massive change to what you're doing. I've identified six different um, things, and this is uh, what I, this is, this is roughly my program. Um, I try to get to my peak heart rate for 10 or 15 minutes. I try to do that five times a week um, in amongst it, at least 30 minutes a day. I'm probably doing a lot more than that. I did 80 minutes on the way to work this morning on a bicycle. Um, strength is um, building muscle. So to do that, you, you warm up with your weights and then you get, after you're well warmed up, then pick the, the heaviest weight that you can lift and do three or four reps with. And then that, that is the thing that if you can do more than four reps, like if you can do 10, then it's not having the same effect. So you want to push to the point where you can just do it four times, maybe three. Flexibility, uh, really important. Balance. So. I, I do a thing, I, my left leg, my, my left ankle, um, you've got to find your body's weaknesses. My left anterior talofibular ligament, if there's any medical people in the room, I'm not, I'm an engineer, but that's, I know that one, uh, that's missing. Um, so what I do is I stand on my left leg and I do all sorts of balance exercises and I wave weights around to challenge that ankle and to improve my balance. Uh, Another important one is posture. Boy, oh boy, have we got a problem. So if you spend your time like this, right, if you're leaning over, then evolutionary things in your background, that's feeding back to your brain that you're down, right? And that, and that you're, you're a little bit fed up, you're, you're losing the social battle around you. And you know. so, it will actually impact your serotonin. It will impact if you're a male, it will impact your testosterone levels and other mood, um, mood enhancers. And so literally your phone is making you depressed because all the time that you're like this, what are you doing? You, you, your body is, is, is telling your brain that you're depressed. The, the stuff that's coming on here is all the doom scrolling from what's gone on in Afghanistan and what's gone on in wherever. And, and pick your least favorite extreme politics and how they're going to come and eat you all. There's a whole bunch of burdens there that you shouldn't be carrying. So put the darn thing down, quit the dooms, quit the doom scrolling, shoulders back, head up. That will immediately change the levels of serotonin and other mood enhancing hormones in your body and tell yourself, 
I'm a child of God, I'm a child of the universe, or whatever, however you conceptualize yourself, I'm here to do some really great stuff. That will immediately impact. And I actually, because um, I'm, I'm quite tall, I'm six foot three, uh, I've met several of you, but so I, I really, um, early this year, I really decided to address my sort of tall person stoop, and I, which I'd always sort of been trying a little bit, but I just got a whole bunch of videos and I just came up with this really good routine. I feel so much better for it. And if you want to um, spend some time Googling, just ask how does exercise improve your brain? Your brain loves it. Uh, how can I start? Well, the, the big one for me is commuting, um, which I do on a bicycle. Uh, or if you can't do that, then, then walk or park a bit further away. And what happens um, where, where I live is about six kilometres from, from the centre of Brisbane and there's a... a um, a park in a in a flood prone area down the bottom and people just park their cars there and and walk or ride or run into town from there so you can certainly think about how i can drive part of the way and then give myself a half hour walk um, you can listen to podcasts while you're doing it and whenever there's uh, whenever the camera's off and i'm in meetings i'm doing chair dips i'm doing stretches i'm doing flexibility i'm doing neck stretches i'm doing anti-stoop stuff um, and I find that actually helps me concentrate on the meetings. Otherwise, I'll just be doing emails. All right, diet. Oh boy, this is a tough one for everyone. And I'm gonna make a disclosure in a minute. <clears throat> so in 1991, the US government had this food pyramid thing that they published that so turned out to be totally wrong because they said to eat lots of carbs and no fat. And they had this stupid idea that fat makes you fat. They didn't distinguish between good fat and bad fat. So that's not the worst problem. The biggest problem in, in uh, that whole scenario is that the government was um, stripping you of your uh, personal critical thought. So they, th some people said, oh, they meant well. They didn't mean well. They meant to take your personal critical thought and tell you not to do it, but to just do what we say, right? That's the worst part of the food pyramid, apart from the fact that it was um, scientifically wrong. <sighs> what the government should say is, if you're gonna be healthy, you need these indicators in, in your blood test and you need um, these physical characteristics and, and the, the stuff about aging, the government should be saying, you need to do these things. Here's a bunch of things that may get you that way. So go out and try these things, work it out for yourself. Instead they said, oh, just go and eat lots of potatoes and what happened? So, you know, we've got the government giving us an obesity crisis. We've got these things giving us uh, a depression crisis. My goodness. Uh, and they're all so easy to fix. So let's do it. Um, focus on fresh live food. Intermittent fasting is, is good. Um, I, I do this quite a lot. Um, I haven't eaten yet today. I'm about to have lunch at one o'clock. And... Um, and so intermittent fasting, I, I do quite a bit of the 16-8. Um, uh, I get to work, I have a very light breakfast, having, uh, having ridden some distance, I'll, um, I'll have a very light breakfast. I didn't have anything this morning because I'd run out of the protein bars that I have. Uh, and then I do that intermittent fasting uh, between then, and so I only eat basically between about noon and about 9 p.m.-ish. Uh, there's a lot of stuff around there. Should you, should you be vegan? Should you be carnivore? Um, but as I said, try it yourself. Uh, don't, don't feel that, and I know Lincoln is right. There's very good evidence that um, plant protein is better than, than meat protein. So you should assume um, that if you can get most of your um, plant protein, if most of your protein from plants, then you should do so. Um, doesn't work for everybody. Um, and the other thing is if you're, if you're a vegan because of the poor cuddly animals, um, you, you might want to really look at the supply chain and I can send you um, some good evidence on that. Uh, this article goes through a, a farm that produces 400 tonnes of peas. They kill 150 deer, 800 possums, 500 wallabies on top of ducks, rabbits, rodents, and of course, insects. There's per kilogram of good quality protein, it's killing about 25 times as many animals, that's not insects, but actual animals um, than, uh, than beef. And then if you go kangaroo, you're going even better. All right. Um, 
calories. So I'll just do a little bit of um, maths here. So base metabolic rate is how much you need just to survive. It's about 8,000 kilojoules. So I'm in Australia, so we use uh, the metric system here. And uh, I've decided that 8,000 kilojoules sounds clunky to an engineer. So I just work in megajoules. I haven't found anybody else doing that. So this is my initiative. The whole world should work in megajoules um, because it's easy to count eight. The protein bar that I have in the morning is about one. The standard salad with tuna I have is about three. Uh, my standard uh, kangaroo meal for dinner is, is, about, uh, is about two. Uh, so you, and once you know those things, um, it's really easy to just um, know if you've eaten in the day. So 1,900 calories, one kilo of body fat is about 37 megajoules or one pound is 4,000 calories. So you've got to miss 4,000 calories to lose a pound. That's a good one. Where does that, when, when you lose the weight, where does it go? Does anyone know? Who wants to guess? You're on mute. Breathe it out. Oh, Mike is spoiling it for everyone. The only, actually, you have to breathe it out. Yeah, so here's the formula for fat, C65, um, H55, uh, and all that. That's a rough formula for fat plus oxygen um, becomes CO2 plus H2O, of which 85% of that is CO2, and the H2O just goes into your body's water balance. Important point with calories is don't resist temptation. It's a waste of nervous energy. And does the Bible, the Bible never says resist temptation. Can he, does it? Who's the theologically qualified people like Neil and Omar? Um, am I correct in remembering that the Bible says to flee temptation, not to uh, resist it? Uh, I, I think, um, uh, you know, minimize the decision-making that you have to make well, and become educated on the correct amount to eat. Okay, so that's a photo from my kitchen. I do that once a week. I make about I make six salads for the week. Um, I've been doing this for over twenty years now. Um, doesn't happen if I'm travelling, but we've been in lockdown or at least unable to travel. Or certainly, if you if you if you live in Queensland, you're pretty much not allowed out of your state. Um, so uh, I, I make that once a week. Um, do try a, a bunch of different diets. Um, you'll hear the advice that you hear given in public is, a, is, on a, is based on a bell curve of people. Now, you don't know where you sit on that bell curve. Um, try a few different things until, until you feel like your body's going well, your exercise is going well, um, your, <clears throat> your blood results are good. Um, and uh, important thing, can't, if you really want to um, get on top of your diet, plan your food out in front. There's a lot of these pre-packaged meal companies. I don't know if you guys have got them over there, but we have heaps of them in Australia that say uh, lose weight with us and they sell you this pre-packaged stuff. And, um, and it's good healthy food, but all you're doing is you're, you're buying somebody else making your decisions for you because they, you, you can do that yourself. You can pre-plan your food and say, here's what I'm eating this week. And this is what I do all the time. My wife and I, we both... Um, pre-plan what we're going to eat and we bulk make food now that the kids are gone and it's um, yeah just it saves stress it saves thinking it means you know what you're going to eat you know it's healthy uh, low or lower carb is is very widely supported now um, by the science but do, do try different things um, and there's there's been a fad around saying eat 30 different plants per week it's actually quite hard to do but I, I'm, I'm getting close oh dear well, here's where I have to make some public confessions. My name's Jonathan and I'm a glutton, right? And I'm gonna be a glutton all my life. It's, I'm, I've got, I'm absolutely not ridiculing um, those who suffer from alcoholism, um, but it's exactly the same thing to me. Um, so I went from, I'll just do this in, in your language, uh, I went from 246 pounds to 174 pounds over that 20 year period. I'm six foot three tall. So it took my BMI on the left from 30.5, which was just in the obese range down to that one's under 22. I have let it float up a bit since then. And I'll, I might talk about that later, um, why, why I didn't, why I chose not to stay that skinny. Um, the blood pressure was 140 on 110, which is uh, heart attack territory. 
and it's now 110 on 70, which is just brilliant. So every time I go to the doctor, they say, gee, your blood pressure's good. So um, burdens that God doesn't want you to carry. All right, supplements. And yeah, this is coming late in the piece. Um, for reasons that I said, there's a whole thing in transhumanism about take the supplement, take the therapy, you'll live forever. Um, not the case. Base multivitamin, vitamin, it's better to get from diet, but I still take them um, three or four times a week. Vitamin D, there's quite good evidence. Uh, vitamin D levels are correlated with COVID um, survival. So do keep those up. It's about the only of the alternative treatments out there. I don't believe the rest of what Joe Rogan said last week. Um, bioflavonoids, quercetin. Now, apoptosis, which is the, um, the auto-destruction of senescent cells, uh, is, that's, a, that's a good supplement to take. Um, resveratrol, terostilbean. So I was an early adopter of resveratrol. I've been on that since, uh, since I first read about it. Um, uh, I'm not sure, the best part of 20 years, maybe not quite. Uh, there's things you can do for your mind focus. So there's some supplements there. Um, they're, all, they're all herbal, they're all good. Um, cholesterol improvers. So I, I know that I've got genetic cholesterol issues and I'm keeping my um, cholesterol at a level just below at the moment. I'm managing to keep it just below where he's gonna prescribe drugs for me. Um, and so there's things like this that you can take. Uh, you, can, you can research that. And if you can, I'll end up on statin drugs at some stage, I expect, but if you can, there might be alternative therapies. I'll come to one of those shortly. Exercise enhances creatine is great for the way your muscles produce power. Uh, particularly those two particularly help me. Um, my body doesn't handle lactic acid as well as a lot of people's. Sleep enhances melatonin. Um, what a superpower that is. So I, I recommend that um, people use that at their time. There's a, a, a new thing on the block is this um, NMN and NR nicotinamide mononucleotide and nicotinamide riboside, which <clears throat> Um, process these NAD plus in, uh, molecules inside your body. It's very new. There's not a lot of evidence out there. There's a lot of hype. Peter Diamandis recently made the statement that he's doing 50% more push-ups since taking this stuff. I don't believe him. It doesn't work that fast. And that's got to be an exaggeration. Anyway, that was his quote. Uh, and there's also joint improvers. So a, a big thing with aging is keeping your, your, your knees and hips in good condition. So um, you can take those. And there's a whole bunch of miscellaneous stuff. And so this is, this is roughly my, my, I don't do them all, all the time. I sort of change it up depending on how I'm feeling or, or what the blood test results said. Um, there are some problems with them. Uh, clinical trials are, are hard to fund um, because uh, these things you can't patent. So there's no money in them. The quality of the results of those is hard to ensure because you get the studies that you do see, you wonder how well they're done. Quality of manufacture, and it can interact with the medicine. So there's some of these things that you wanna just check out with your doctor. And particularly they are no substitute for a good diet and everything that's gone before, but to use a horribly inappropriate um, analogy, they're the icing on the cake. Uh, I like this examine.com, which I think several people here have, um, have mentioned. They, they, will, they do publish guidance based on very small studies. I was looking at one thing the other day where it had um, saying it's probably doing this, it's probably doing that. And it was based on one study of 10 people. Uh, that's, that doesn't actually tell you anything, but it, it's enough to say, to me that says what I get out of that is, this thing is likely to help. It's not. It's unlikely to harm. You might as well give it a try. Um, yeah. Another uh, cheap anti-aging drug on the horizon is metformin. It's a drug that's often prescribed to diabetics, and uh, it's, it, it's quite uh, quite widely used. And there's um, it's very cheap, so there's no money in making it. So getting a serious trial funded is difficult. And uh, Neil Barzilai's, and near Barzilai is trying to make that happen. He's looking for $75 million to do a proper scientific study on it. And the um, FDA was broadly supportive, spoke to them about the design of the study. And, and um, so that, that was a good thing. Uh, but 
someone's got to come up with $75 million. I'm surprised those billionaires can't just part with it. I, I don't think metformin's a good choice for me because it impacts, it makes your um, lactic acid processing worse and I struggle with that already. So anyway, technology. Does anyone know what hey, that, Jonathan? that is? Sorry? Uh, yeah, sorry. So uh, I just, um, I think Neil had a question and uh, maybe a couple of things I thought would be great to jump in here. Uh, Neil, sure. uh, what was your question? Oh, I was just uh, uh, asking about the, the downside to uh, the statin drugs. You, you said that you felt it was inevitable, but you wanted to delay it as long as possible. Um, and so I just wanted to, to hear a little bit more about that. Well, look, some of my family members who've, who've been on those drugs have, um, have had uh, some side effects. So uh, in, including leg pain and various other things. So I just figured that um, if I could avoid it, um, I, I would uh, or delay it. Yep. I think Omar has something. Yeah, Jonathan, I have um, two questions. One, um, can play, playing video games be considered an exercise? Um, Depends if it's if weak it, and you're jumping around. Yeah. <laughs> well, my posture is always up when I'm doing video games. That's what I was asking. Mm -hmm. um, but the second question is, I know, I, I know that you didn't talk about this subject, but it comes up with, with um, life extension. How long could humans possibly live given the technology? Could we live 200 years, 300 years? Um, I, I think that's too hard to determine at the moment. Um, what, what, what we've got at the moment is there's a series of things we can do now that will, if, if you're gonna, if you take no action, then you're gonna make, and you're gonna make 65 or 70. If, if you follow this program that I put up, you're gonna make at least the end of your 70s, right? Um, if beyond that, um, I, there's, I, I certainly think we'll see a lot more um, centenarians. I'm hoping to make 100 myself, don't know whether that'll happen, um, got to avoid the, the cancer um, issues in my family. Um, so, yeah, I, to be honest, Omar, I just think the future is, is really clouded. Um, if the singularity actually happens in 2045, uh, then um, I'll be turning about 80 at that point. So I just have to uh, see what technology exists then. Uh, but it, I think that the, the future is, um, is really unclear. I just think we need to take steps now to make sure we get there. And I'm, I'm an engineer and a, uh, a thinker and unraveler of other people's uh, pseudo information. So uh, I, I really haven't, I've seen so many different opinions on that as to whether we could make 120 or 200 um, or longer. Hey, Jonathan. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Lincoln. Yep. I, uh, I spend uh, unusual amounts of time reading clinical studies on dietary supplements. Yep, yep. For yep. my business. Yeah. No, yeah. And uh, when, when your presentation is kind of wrapped up, I, I have some feedback for you on that section if you'd oh, like I'd, to. I'd love to. I'd love to because I, 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 if you've got some good sources on those, I'd love to because I know you've done some really good research on that and everything that I've read from you over the years has been excellent. Yeah, I, I've. But I don't really want to derail at this point because I could become yeah. too long winded. Yeah. Uh, so look, yeah, I'd love, love to hear that later. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions or I'll try and roll through the rest of this fairly quickly. Um, this little chap, do you know what he is? Uh, he's an axolotl. He's a native of two lakes in Mexico and he's um, nearly extinct. 
you can cut one of his legs off and he'll grow a new one. You can rip his eyes out and you can, those external grill, gills, you can cut those off and they'll grow back. This genome is 32 billion base pairs compared to 3.1 in humans. So his genome is actually 10 times the length of ours. Uh, and all I can say is, boy, have we got a lot to learn in this space. I don't think, uh, I don't know what we could, if we can learn how that animal works and how it succeeds with its remarkable regeneration, I don't know what therapies. Remember um, when the genome was sequenced, we were told that 90% of the DNA was junk. We now know it's not junk, it's non-coding DNA. Um, it's like the old myth that we only use 10% of our brains. So um, don't, don't leap to, to conclusions when you, when you see things, we, we, can, we can learn a lot. Uh, so I've been dividing future tech into the sort of different levels. So at the molecular level, um, upcoming drugs including include this one, Inclosiren, which is a synthetic short interrupting RNA package directed against this particular PS, PCSK9 enzyme. And that uh, PCSK9 prevents bad cholesterol from being uh, reabsorbed. So if you, if you get your PSC9 down, then your cholesterol goes down. Uh, working, and this, this becomes working you know, like a laser. Um, that would remove the need for statins drugs or, or, or a good part of the need. Um, the studies out are certainly suggesting you get rid of 70 to 80% of them. Um, and, you, <clears throat> and so this, this whole RNA revolution that's coming is gonna be able to change our blood chemistry in quite precise ways. There's also the potential to modify our DNA so that we produce different proteins and different enzymes. Um, and there's some hard ethical questions about that. It's just tuning up your machine to make it work better. At the cell level, um, senolytics, which is things that destroy um, senescent cells. Um, quercetin is, is a good one, but there's lots of others as well. Um, stem cell, cell therapy. So um, Mr. Yamanaka got a Nobel prize for discovering how to send, to reverse the age of cells to create new stem cells. Um, there's already success with stem cells regenerating spinal cord. Um, Chris, uh, Mr. Superman, who was paraplegic, what was his name? Anyway, <clears throat> he always said he wanted to walk again. Um, we're getting close to that. Injecting stem cells into knee, knee cartilage. Uh, Dave Asprey is a, a fan of that. Um, to that's much cheaper than a new knee reconstruction. There's over a thousand stem cell clinics in the US. Ten of those are FDA approved. Uh, one is Terry Grossman's, who's uh, who I mentioned before. He's a he's a really good guy to keep an eye on. Uh, and nanobots for cell replacement. You know, we could improve our red blood cells. At an organ level, you can bioprint an organ scaffold and and kind of seed it, you can replace your organ with a mechanical device or you can regenerate organs using stem cells. So what are we gonna do with it? It's gonna be a big mix, it's gonna be all those things. Um, so what actions to take? Uh, first thing is to just evaluate what you hear, uh, read the studies. Has anyone been to Radfest or has anyone heard of Radfest? They did a, a webinar the other day. What, what did you think of it? Anyone who went? I think there's, there's some really, really good stuff, some good exciting stuff happening there, but there's a couple of things that really bug me about it. Um, what do you think bugs me about it? Well, it's the people who aren't coming. Calico's not coming, Unity Biotech's not coming, Chan Zuckerberg's not coming, universities aren't coming, Ray Kurzweil, Terry aren't coming. All these other people who I admire aren't coming. And I started to think, well, uh, why is that and, and what's going on? Um, what, what's happening at Radfest is, is there's some very serious science, including from Aubrey and uh, going on there. There's, there's a lot of activism and the activism's great. Um, they've got a whole bunch of people to take their health really seriously. That's fantastic. There's a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, encouraging early adoption of uh, things that, that look good, but aren't, aren't proven to FDA standards. Um, on the other hand, there's some off-label cures with you know, pretty limited evidence. And 
Um, so it's, it's a real it's a real mix going on at Radfest. There's there's some good stuff, but um, th these sorts of people uh, are operating at a different level. Um, here, for example, is Unity Biotechnology. They're saying exactly the same thing, targeting the root cause of age-related diseases, but they're not coming to Radfest, which I'm sad about. Anyway, got me thinking. Um, there are different approaches. Big organisations don't always spend money well, and we know Aubrey in particular has been very uh, very frugal with his, with his money. There's a bit of a conundrum with the FDA. We both demand rigorous proof, or Will Falloon created his FDA Holocaust Museum for the errors that they've made, and or the, the drugs that they delayed. Uh, I think that's a bit harsh. Um, what we get is we've got a system running through the FDA where we can spot one bad outcome in a million doses. People demand that. But they also demand the freedom to experiment. There's obviously a problem with the time scale required for anti-aging trials. 0.1% of stem cell clinics are FDA approved. The others are operating in this kind of gray zone. And what's really happening is the market's kind of moving ahead of our ability to regulate and to assess to the standard that we used to that we used to demand. There's no solution to that. What we're getting is this activism, visionary entrepreneurialism by the Radfest and the real rigor of the FDA and, and those two, there's there's a tension there. A tension that there's no solution I can't that I can think of. Yeah, so this is a great site, BioArchive. Um, you can, this is uh, pre-print papers. You can find out what people are working on. Uh, here was one I picked up on caloric restriction. Um, the effect of CR was not universally beneficial. It absolutely is universally um, for cardiovascular metabolic risk syndrome, um, but uh, significant reductions in bone mineral density, muscle size and function. So you, you need to look at that. You can be too skinny. Um, this study goes on to uh, try, they tried like about 3,000 mice on different um, caloric restriction in, intermittent fasting. And they measured all their, the, the mice were all unrelated. They were very heterogeneous from genetically. And they mapped their um, gene gene alleles, the, the variants of their genes against um, the different uh, caloric restriction regimes. And uh, what was fascinating about that is the caloric restriction improved all of the, the mice, but some had only improved like five or 10% and some had improved 60%. So we, we will in future be able to do the same thing with humans and work out which of these interventions or or what caloric restriction is, is potentially optimal for you personally. Otherwise you've got to go and do what I've done, which is say, hey, maybe I'm too skinny here. Have a look at some of the things that were going wrong in my body and let, let my weight float up a little bit. Um, this is another good site. I like to just find out, um, look at authors, how much do they publish? So there's Dave Sinclair, he's got 242 results. Um, there's Aubrey, uh, he's got 184. So you can go and, um, read some of these, some of them are free if they've got that free PMC article, otherwise they might be paywalled. So in conclusion, what shall it profit a human? Who's gonna finish that sentence for me? If he gained the whole world, but lose his soul. So why are you here? Um, why do you wanna have this long life? Do you need a reason? Um, we're here to serve. Um, we're here to carry the right yoke. Uh, work is a vexation and what is eternal life at the end of the day is to know you the only true god uh, to be in touch with the creator simulator and the the archetype of the highest uh, moral example that we have uh, so what i hear from some people is i just want to live a long life and have fun uh, i'd suggest that the pursuit of happiness uh, it's better to pursue a vocation that's what we're here for. All right, actions, decide what you're gonna do about these seven things. Uh, learn to discern, um, certainly on the supplements front, Lincoln knows about a million times more than I know. Um, find trusted groups that you can have different opinions with. Um, we, we won't all agree and not all our bodies are the same. Um, 
there are some things that are certain there are some things that you will need to trial and evaluate yourself on on your own physical body and have a look at your results and then above all know why you plan what's your life plan uh, where's your your spirituality your worldview uh, all the things that uh, terry was saying in our last session thank you sorry for going over time Jonathan, I really appreciate that last question you opened about why are we doing this? Yep. I, I think that very often we got we get caught up in poor reasons for it. And you know, fortunately, we have organizations like the Christian Transhumanist Association that help us get back on the right path for, mm, for um, the purpose of living longer, healthier lives. Good. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, yeah that, I, I was good. Sorry, I'm very impressed, Jonathan. I was not expecting to learn so much in so little time. Um, so great job putting all this together. I was definitely, I think the part that really uh, got to me was, was um, about you finding, you know, you noticing your time uh, in your bike run and, and then going to your doctor and say, hey, can you test this? And it, to me, as a you know, data scientist and thinking AI, it just tells me the importance of data and tracking and, and, and capturing mm -hmm. that um, and, and kind of excited about some technologists to, to do that, even, uh, you know, just improving just that piece mm -hmm. in general. And, and saw how you, you turn out that you're, you're, you're looking at your numbers and that paid off. Uh, so I, I thought that that, you know, beyond just... Of course, a lot of the, the great stuff on health, that, that to me was, was the, the highlight. Oh, thanks, Lars. Yeah. Um, Marta highlighted in the chat about being an informed patient. And um, yeah, I think mm. uh, your kind of focus on agency um, was key, both in, in understanding that you have a kind of uh, your own unique um, biochemical makeup, but also that you really need to be uh, an activist in your own health. And I know for a lot of people, that's very hard. Um, and uh, because maybe, you know, dealing with uh, uh, medical professionals as authority figures, something like this, it's, it's hard to um, even raise those things. Um, I've seen this uh, for people. And so a lot of times, if they don't feel comfortable being an agent in their own healthcare, then they will go the opposite way and write off the whole uh, scientific mm -hmm. medical project and and um, look for other other avenues. And so I think that's that's an important thing for us to work on and, and figure out um, how to yeah how to um, uh, claim that agency and help others claim it as well. I hadn't, I hadn't seen the, uh, the chat, sorry, while I was on presenter. Uh, yes, the what's mine to do? That was the other quote that I, I meant to, to put up there from Terry. Yes, uh, something, I wanted, something I wanted to add is that um, everything you said, Jonathan, is very tangible and um, very real. And um, oftentimes when, when I hear speakers talk about this, they go into virtual worlds and mind of loathing and all these other topics that mm. I think, to be honest, lose a lot of people, right? Uh, so uh, I encourage you to talk about this with anyone that will hear you because it's, it's, again, healthy living. That's all you're talking about, right? So, so yeah. uh, I think it's a very real message that, that can make a lot of stride with, with people and help people live longer. Yeah, I want to I want to second Javier and say that yeah, there was just truly a balance in uh, both science being you know informed and uh, showing the results and not saying these people are crazy, this is terrible, and, and but a passion that wasn't fundamentalist, right? It wasn't a passion of like why are people eating meat? You know, we should stop killing the animals. Uh, I I love the kangaroo piece. I I need to find some uh, kangaroo meat here, but yeah, but there was definitely a true balance where you invited us in. Uh, to 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 reevaluate re our lives without preaching at us. So that was you know ha ha rare to find, especially in this area of health. Good. I I, I do hope to um, 
raise the, the conversation. Um, Proverbs 11, 1. Um, who can quote that one? The Lord hates dishonest scales. Um, one of the problems with the dishonest scales that exist is it's in our discourse. Um, if you're evaluating an issue, you're not evaluating it, you're listening to what your team says and you're repeating your team shibboleths, you know, which side of politics you're on. Uh, the the, the polarisation and the fact that people say, you've got to go with the FDA, you've got to go with the, the rad fest, or, and then you've got these billionaires in the middle who are, who are saying, yes, we can do this with ageing, and, you, and you're sort of slowly bringing the FDA around, and we haven't quite got the World Health Organisation on this yet. So, um, yeah, P people will join the political team and pick one of those things instead of trying to understand the, the nuance and the interplay of interests and then out of that diversity of interests, work out what's the best way forward to do things, you know? For me personally, I mean, for, for each, each of us to listen to those and evaluate it fairly, uh, not jump on their team shibboleths. I love how incredibly nuanced you are about most things, Jonathan, and, and I appreciated your presentation tonight. I am curious to hear uh, Lincoln's comments on the the supplements in response to to what you shared. Given that you know, I, I know that's a that's something. Oh, plus, he's, he's an entrepreneur in the in the business, and he's he's done a great a job building his yeah. own company. Yeah. So yeah, you could you could think about doing a session on that, Lincoln, if you liked. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, we could yeah. do that sometime. I, I'm, I'm happy though to give you just some feedback on your slide if you wanna bring that back up. It, it just, there, I, there were several things that came to mind as you were talking where I wanted to like cheer you on on some things and some things I thought you might be interested to know on some others. Yeah, uh, that should come up. Is that, uh, all right, let me go back to that slide. Um, what I love about the discussions around supplements, particularly in combination with what you did with exercise and diet, is, is mm -hmm. that it's just so practical, right? It's, it's not, yeah. you know, pie in the sky transhumanism. This is, this is actually recognizing that our bodies are biological machines and that we can program them through the way that we yeah. live and eat. And, you know, it's, it, I, I, I find a lot of value in these discussions. Yeah, so there we go. Um, so just some thoughts as I, as I read through this, the first one on multivitamins, I think you're right. Um, it's pretty hard to find much evidence that taking a multivitamin is like going to save your life or make you live longer or anything yeah. like that, unless you are dealing with deficiencies. And some of us, some of us probably don't eat very well. And so in those cases, it may be, but then a challenge you run into is that lots of multivitamins are um, balanced in really bizarre ways, uh, like putting in way too much of some vitamins that have limited evidence for supplementation and things like that. So multivitamins, it's, it's I think you, I think you characterized that really well. You're right about vitamin D, big deal. Um, for lots of things. You mentioned COVID. There is, there does seem to be a, a correlation there, um, but also lots of other powerful um, things. Vitamin D3 in particular, of course. Um, my wife takes, is currently taking mega doses of vitamin D3 under the supervision of her doctor uh, mm -hmm. to get her levels of vitamin D3 up to a certain level. But most of us that are like majorly deficient, we should probably still be taking vitamin D3 supplements. That I would recommend that to just about everybody. Uh, bioflavonoids, yeah, um, agree with you on that. Lots of, but that's a very, of course, broad, diverse set of things. Mm, yeah. some, some have much more evidence than others. And uh, quercetin is actually a bioflavonoid. Yeah, um, it probably should have gone into one. I think resveratrol um, is too, isn't it? Or? Yep. So is resveratrol, terostilbene. So on resveratrol and terostilbene, um, a lot of people call terostilbene a better resveratrol. Yep. And then um, a major manufacturer of terostilbene recently stopped manufacturing it because they found that it raises LDL cholesterol, 
Although there's also some evidence that you can counteract the effect of the cholesterol raising if you couple it with um, grapeseed extract. So if anybody's taking those supplements, you might consider uh, coupling it with grapeseed extract to make sure that it's not giving you a negative side effect. I know that David Sinclair, for example, is a big fan of resveratrol. Yeah. Um, on, you, you've got your mind focus supplements there. You've got some really great ones listed. Bacopa really has exceptional evidence among supplements for memory enhancement. Uh, rhodiola, really good evidence for rhodiola for various um, brain benefits. Limpocetine, decent evidence. Acetyl L carnitine, especially if you couple it with alpha lipoic acid and alpha GPC. Probably a lot of great long-term brain benefits from that. Ginkgo is controversial. People have attributed all kinds of benefits to, to ginkgo, and most of the short-term benefits have been discredited. But I'm aware of a 30-year cohort study that compared users of um, paracetam, which is a... Uh, rice, uh, racetam, yeah. It's a yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really more of a drug than a supplement, although it's a gray area thing that people sell. Um, but anyway, there's a 30 year cohort study of people who took ginkgo and people who took paracetam and the ginkgo users had superior long term um, wow. brain performance to those who are taking paracetam. So something to think about maybe for long term is the ginkgo, but short term, most of the benefits have kind of been discredited and ginseng. Um, mild effects, but yeah, there, there's some pretty good evidence for mild cognitive benefits there, especially if you don't overuse it. Ginseng, actually, there's some studies that show that you can overuse ginseng in the same way as you can overuse caffeine. Yep, yep. On cholesterol, um, I think that you actually didn't list your best cholesterol supplement in the cholesterol section. You listed it down in miscellaneous with garlic. Garlic okay. has, has really exceptionally good evidence among supplements for helping with healthy cholesterol levels. And I, and, and I know you mentioned concern with that personally. That's something I'd recommend that you, you look at our studies on garlic. I think you'll be fascinated by that. Garlic and cholesterol. Um, the fish oil, really the best thing that fish oil has going for it is that it actually improves triglyceride, not cholesterol. The evidence for for fish oil helping with cholesterol isn't that great, but it's excellent for triglyceride. Uh, exercise enhancers, creatine. Man, creatine, if you're gonna take just one supplement, not even just for exercise, but for cognitive performance and all, and all around health improvements, creatine's a great contender. And so is magnesium. Get to work every day. There you go, <laughs> yeah, creatine, baby. People get confused on creatine and they think, oh, isn't that just what weightlifters take to make themselves look funny? No, it is not what they take to make themselves look funny. Creatine is safe um, and everybody should take it, in my opinion. And the evidence, it, it has been very, very well studied. Deep evidence on creatine for lots of different benefits. Sleep enhancers, melatonin. So melatonin is awesome, not just for sleep. It works generally well to induce hmm. sleep. Uh, maybe a little bit of improvement on quality of sleep for some people, but mainly for inducing it. But what's even cooler about melatonin is what people almost never talk about. It's an excellent gerald protector, potentially. The evidence there is still accumulating, but it's pretty persuasive. If you want, a, if you want to spend an afternoon um, going down the rabbit hole of gerald protectors, go to PubMed, which um, is an excellent resource for looking up, you know, clinical studies type in melatonin and gero protector or melatonin and cancer and read a bunch of studies. Melatonin is amazing. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that you can't actually market melatonin for as a supplement vendor, especially in the United States, because the FDA regulates claims that can be made about supplements. You can't make any claims um, be, in relation to any disease state for supplements. But um, there's really good reason to believe that melatonin has a lot of benefits for various disease states. And you can find that if you do a PubMed search on melatonin. And again, Gerald Protector would be a good place to start. Melatonin and cancer would be a good place to start. 
Uh, you, you're, you're right about NN, NMN, NR. It's kind of a fad right now, but the evidence is accumulating. It looks like it's promising, but it hasn't. They haven't really yet done any studies that demonstrate actual practical benefits. They've all been kind of chemistry benefits to humans, which yeah. theoretically should play out as practical benefits, but the science is still accumulating. Uh, joints, this is one where I've got some strong feedback for you. Those traditional supplements that people take for joints, glucosamine and chondroitin, um, the evidence that they help with joints is not great. Right. There's actually better evidence for glucosamine and anti-aging, healthy aging, than there is yep. for glucosamine and joint benefits. Um, what, it, what you should look at hard for joints, I would recommend, would be, um, let's see, a couple of different things. Uh, number one is vitamin K2, MK7, really good for, for bone health in general, which will play out in joints. Another good one for joints would be um, Boswellia serrata, which is Indian frankincense. Really great evidence for helping with joints there. Another one would be S-adenosylmethionine. Some people call it SAMI, has good evidence for helping with joints. Um, what else? Those, those are probably the big ones. Um, t t uh, there, there are some standardized extracts of Boswellia serrata that also in particular have strong evidence for helping with joints. Uh, a good extract would be Apreflex to look at. And th the nice thing about those is that they require much smaller doses than just taking kind of the raw plant. Uh, let's see. I think that's most of what came to mind based on your supplement page. Oh, was, was there Thanks a page after this one? Remind me. Oh, I was just talking about some of the issues with, um, with quality. Um, so some of the Oh yeah, that's a huge deal. There are supplement yeah. vendors that don't even, so there are supplement suppliers, supplement material suppliers that are completely dishonest. They will yeah. just sell uh, just- yeah, flower, white color flower. Flower yeah. or, or worse. And then there are vendors who just trust the claims of their suppliers and ship out supplements that they've never tested themselves. It happens with alarming regularity. So that warning is a big deal. If you are buying supplements from a vendor that does not provide uh, certificates of analysis that show that they have retested and verified the claims of their suppliers, switch vendors like right now because they're probably lying to you or they're too ignorant to know whether they can lie to you or tell the truth. It's a big deal in the industry. So yeah, that's a great warning. Hey, Micah, I would like to nominate Lincoln to do our next month's presentation. <laughs> I think he's, if a, he's up for it. I think there's a lot of interest in this, and, and I would love to hear like a mm. full-fledged presentation on what the state is right now of supplements and, and in different categories and areas and what some of the, the cutting-edge research is, and um, I think that'd be great. If I'm available, I, I, that actually would be fun. Um, and if not next month, then another month. But I, let me, here, let me check my calendar. Yeah, so I was asking in the chat if there's any uh, kind of uh, recipe <laughs> or if you just have to try the different amounts and different supplements to see what works for you. Or, or if there's some kind of template recipe out there that tells you, oh, if you take this and this and this, uh, that, that should be good for you. Jonathan gave a really good recommendation and that is to pay attention to your, your unique situation. Um, and, and of course I would add to that, consult with your doctor. But it, with those as context, there are, there's some really, great resources to help you figure out dosing and things like that. One Jonathan mentioned examine.com is an excellent website, um, but do pay attention to, so they, they kind of try to classify their research based on levels of evidence and, and they'll be really upfront with you about um, what they're, what they are talking about and whether it's based on like one study or multiple studies, whether it's based on lab studies or human studies, they do a really good job of calling that out 
and I, I, I can't praise examine.com enough. It's a great resource. Um, but if you really want to go to the source and you want to know, you know, what has been studied, what were the doses used? Were they used on humans? How long were they used? What were the results? You've got to go to PubMed and you've got to look at the primary research there and then discuss that with your doctor, discuss that with friends who um, know the industry and know what's going on in supplements. And then that'll help you make an informed decision. Um, those would be my, my biggest recommendations. After getting advice, of course, from your doctor, if you want to use websites to help, the two best, in my opinion, would be PubMed and examine.com. Yeah, just looking through the, the chat, um, certainly Martha's asked about pregnant and, and breastfeeding women. Um, the rule in Australia is you pretty much can't take anything. You can't even take an aspirin if you get a headache, you know. Um, that's, uh, yeah, you've got to uh, be, be extremely careful, especially um, some of these supplements you, you think on balance, they're probably not going to do anything and they're probably going to help, but you just don't know. You know that's what they thought about thalidomide. Uh, yeah, some have been tested um, on, yeah. in situations with women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, and yeah. many have not. And it's definitely a, a question worth keeping in mind as you supplement, have there been tests done on my situation? And yeah. a great place to check on that is PubMed. It's surprising. So melatonin, for example, I often hear people vilify melatonin saying, um, you know, it's never been tested long-term. It's never been tested on children. No, those are both false. Melatonin has been tested long-term and on children long-term. And it's been found to be safe, even for children going through um, puberty. It has not had significant um, uh, effects on the, on the process of puberty. And I can show you the clinical studies that have, have shown those results. Now, do we need more studies on that? Is it good to get do more studies to confirm those? Absolutely. We can always use more studies. But people who tell you that those things have not been studied don't know what they're talking about. They melatonin, for example, has been studied in, in multiple studies of periods of years, uh, including studies on children and um, including high doses. Like we're talking five to 10 milligrams. And these are, you know, these are strong clinical doses of melatonin and very minimal, um, if any, adverse effects reported in these long-term studies. So melatonin is a remarkably safe supplement based on the studies that exist today. I want, I want to know about um, like what people's typical experience is, because every time I talk to someone, at least in my family, about uh, melatonin, they typically report having bad sleep experiences with it. So is that, uh, you know, and, and maybe crazy dreams and waking up at weird times and so forth, is that... Um, an anomaly a loading period issue like what what would you kind of guess that is going on there the main evidence for the main the evidence for melatonin in regards to sleep is particularly strong on inducing sleep not necessarily on the quality of sleep if you want to improve the quality of sleep there's other things to look at uh, l-theanine would be a, a good option um, ashwagandha would be a good option. Magnesium glycinate would be a good option. Lavender, lemon balm, maybe GABA. All of those things can be paired safely with melatonin. But the main reason I would recommend melatonin to people isn't even for the sleep benefits. It's mainly for the systemic benefits that come. Um, a lot, so here's a crazy stat that almost nobody seems to know about. When people think of melatonin, they think, oh, well, doesn't your body create it naturally in the brain? Yeah, it does. It creates a little bit of in the brain, but guess where 90% of the melatonin in your body is created? In your gastrointestinal tract. Huge amounts of it are being created by your gas, comparatively compared to your brain in your gastrointestinal tract. And guess where a lot of the benefits of melatonin supplementation occur? In your gastrointestinal tract. There's great evidence that it helps with ulcers, great evidence that it helps with esophagus dysfunction. Um, and even great evidence that can help with tinnitus. Um, and, and so, sorry, I'm, I'm derailing from your question, but your, your question being, does it help with the quality of sleep? I don't know. I, the evidence I've seen on that is ambivalent, really. 
where it helps mostly in relation to sleep is onset, um, getting you to fall asleep faster than you might otherwise. But then if you've taken other things that help with quality of sleep, they, they go well together. Okay, yeah, I have a question. Well, I do have more intense dreams, yes. I'll, I'll add to that, Lincoln. I, I have more intense dreams and, and can wake up with, with uh, more intense crazy dreams, but when it works well, and I, I, it, I also find it helps me stay asleep longer, which it's not supposed to do that, <laughs> but, uh, but I reckon it does. Anyway, sorry. It does ahead. for some people, yeah. yeah. You know, another thing, if people want dreams, a great supplement for promoting lucid dream states, and it's not great, but it's the best one that there is evidence for, is vitamin B6. There's good actually job. clinical evidence for that. Whereas I don't know of clinical evidence for any other supplements that are good at helping promote kind of lucid dreams or stronger dream state states. Sorry, uh, go ahead, Neil. Very important question. How do you take your kangaroo? I mean, are we, you know, I, I, I love, I, I'm a big fan of red meat. <laughs> You know, and one of my favorites for health reasons is actually venison here in the States. It's oh, a yeah. deer, deer yeah. meat. And I've, I've got to imagine kangaroo probably has similar, has a similar profile to, to venison. But what do you make? Like what, what, what exactly do you, are you eating kangaroo jerky? Or are you like, you know, putting it in stew? What are you doing with your kangaroo meat? You, you can, you can do lots of things with it. Um, and there's, there's a, a brand that I buy that, um, comes in it comes with with steaks with uh you know sort of pre-seasoned steaks or but the thing that's easy to make in bulk and stick in the freezer is uh is mince and you can and i, I tend to make that um with mexican seasonings because the mexican sort of has less sugar in it than the bolognese type things and at that point you wouldn't know you, you probably can't detect what what meat it is in the first place but if, if you eat it as a steak it's it's a strong um, dark red meat with no fat. Um, is it pretty gamey? Like a lot of sinew? yeah. I'm not sure what they mean by gamey. Um, oh, it, it's yeah. it, it's not to, it's not to everyone's taste. That's for sure. But if you if you get it as get it as the mince, then uh, then it will be to your taste. Um, well, the other one to eat kangaroo, to eat kangaroo in, tacos. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, or you can do or um, well, alpaca is the other good one if you can get it. It's, that's beautiful meat. It's, uh, widely available in South America. Oh, and Jonathan, right. I'm there with you on the intermittent fasting, brother. Good stuff. I, a, I do recommend um, people consider it. It's not for everybody, but man, no. it can be effective for some people. So, Sergey Young is... No, I know it's over over time, but Lincoln, is it true that it's not recommended for women? Because hormones and everything, intermittent fasting doesn't work as well for us. You know, I, I've I've read some concerns along those lines, but I I have to say that I've not seen strong clinical evidence that it's bad for women. Um, but I also I have you know most of the most of the research that I've looked at on intermittent fasting, I haven't done with the intent of distinguishing differences for the genders. So um, that's, that's worth more research than I've done. I've, mm -hmm. I've practiced clinic or intermittent fasting myself now for uh, two and a half years, very consistently. I do what uh, Jonathan mentioned, um, eight hours of eating every day. And uh, I feel, I feel very good doing it. My wife um, has sometimes um, mentioned similar concerns to the one that you just mentioned. And, and we've looked a little bit into it and haven't found much, but it merits more research than I've done. Uh, she does some, she, she does it less consistently than me, but she does it. And uh, anyway, um, it, it's, a, it's a, I wish I could answer your question better, I'm sorry. Most people do it um, sort of midnight to 8 p.m. Sorry, mid midday to 8 p.m. Um, as the eating window. But um, Sergey Young came out um, in the last month and said it's better to do it um, from 6 a.m. or you know, for, and miss dinner rather than breakfast. Uh, so 
there's something to something to research there. Um, the downside of missing dinner is dinner's dinner's very sociable and important with families. So um, I I would have researched that, except I'd already pre-decided I wouldn't make that change uh, for for other reasons. You know. Yeah, I'm, Guys, I, have I'm to, the same. I have to go, I'm... folks. Uh, I'm I'm still at work. Uh, I've got a meeting in half an hour, and I've got to get ready for it. Uh, work. So, yeah, it's, Thank it's still you so Friday much, afternoon. Uh, do a great uh, job. Uh, yeah, talk soon. Thanks. Yeah, thank thanks so much, and uh, thank you all for being uh, being with us uh, next month, October seventh. Uh, join us, and we'll have another great discussion. Uh, but yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for participating. It's uh, been a great uh, great conversation. To everyone, bye bye.